round of thoughts he had touched on them indirectly in many medical works concerning will and purposefulness as superior forms of adaptation. Mimicry and protective coloring. The survival of the fittest. And the hypothesis that the path of natural selection is the very path leading to the formation and emergence of consciousness. And what was subject? What was object? How was their identity to be defined? In the doctor's reflections, Darwin was next to Schelling, the butterfly that had just flown by next to modern painting and impressionist art. He thought of creation, the creature, creativeness, the instincts of creation and simulation. Once again he fell asleep but woke up a moment later. A soft, muffled conversation nearby had disturbed him. The few words he overheard were enough to tell him that it concerned some secret and illicit plan. He had not been seen, the conspirators had no suspicion of his presence. The slightest movement that would betray it now might cost him his life. Yuri E. Andreevich remained quiet and listened. Some of the voices he recognized. They were those of the scum of the partisans, hangers-on such as Goshka, Sanka, Koska, and their usual follower Taran Shiaikaluzin, young good-for-nothings who were at the bottom of every kind of outrage and disorder. Zakhar Gorazdik was also there. An even more sinister personality who was mixed up in the affair of the vodka brewing but was not being prosecuted just now because he had denounced the chief offenders. What surprised Yuri E. Andreevich was the presence of Sivo Blue, a partisan of the Crack Silver Company who was one of the commander's bodyguards. In keeping with a tradition going back to Stenkarazin and Pugakev, this favorite, known to be in the confidence of the chief, was nicknamed the Hetman's Ear. And yet he too seemed to be in the conspiracy. The plotters were negotiating with delegates from the advanced positions of the enemy. The delegates were inaudible, so softly did they speak to the traitors, and Yuri E. Andreeva could only guess that they were speaking when an occasional silence seemed to interrupt the whispering. Zakhar Gorazdik, the drunkard, was doing most of the talking, cursing every other moment in his hoarse, wheezing voice. He seemed to be the ringleader. Now, you others, listen. The chief thing is, we've got to keep it quiet. If anybody talks you see this knife? I'll rip his guts. Is that clear? Now you know as well as I do we're stuck. There's no way out for us. We've got to earn our pardon. We've got to work such a trick as nobody's seen before. They want him taken alive. Now they say their boss Gulavoy is coming. They corrected him Galiolan but he did not catch the name and said General Galeiv. That's our chance. There won't be another like it. Here are their delegates. They'll tell you all about it. They say we've got to take him alive. Now you tell them, you others. Now the others, the delegates, began to speak. Yuri E. Andreeva could not catch a word but from the length of the pause he judged that they explained the proposal in detail. Then, Gorazdik spoke again. Hear that, boys? You see what a nice fellow he is. Why should we pay for him? He isn't even a man he's a half-wit of some sort, a monk, or a hermit. You stop grinning, Tiryoshka. I'll give you something to grin about, you stupid ass. I wasn't talking about you. I'm telling you he's a hermit, that's what he is. Let him have his way and he'll turn you all into monks eunuchs. What does he tell you? No cursing, no getting drunk, all this stuff about women. How can you live like that? Tonight we'll get him down to the ford. I'll see that he comes. Then we'll all fall on him together. It won't be hard. That's nothing. What's difficult is that they want him alive. Tie him up, they say. Well, if it doesn't work out that way I'll deal with him myself, I'll finish him off with my own hands. They'll send their people along to help. He went on explaining the plan, but gradually they moved away and the doctor ceased to hear them. That's Libreus they're plotting to hand over to the whites or to kill, the swine, he thought with horror and indignation, forgetting how often he had himself wished his tormentor dead. How was it to be prevented? 
he decided to go back to Kamenodversky and tell him of the plot without mentioning any names, and also to warn Libreus. But when he got back, Kamenodversky had gone. Only his assistant was keeping an eye on the smoldering fire to prevent its spreading. The crime did not take place. It was forestalled. The conspiracy, as it turned out, was known. That day the details were disclosed and the plotters seized. Sivo Blue had played the role of agent provocateur. Yuri E. Andreevak felt even more disgusted. 9. It was learned that the partisans' families were now within two days' journey of the camp. The partisans were getting ready to welcome them and soon afterwards to move on. Yuri E. Andreevak went to Pamphil Palik. He found him at the entrance to his tent, an axe in his hand. In front of him was a tall heap of birch saplings. He had cut them down but had not yet stripped them. Some had fallen where they stood and, toppling with their whole weight, had dug the sharp ends of their broken branches into the damp ground. Others he had dragged from a short distance and piled on top of the rest. Shuddering and swaying on their springy branches, these trees lay neither on the ground nor close together. It seemed as though with outstretched arms they were fending off Pamphil, who had cut them down, and that their tangled green foliage was barring his way to his tent. It's for my dear guests, explained Pamphil. My wife and children. The tent is too low. And the rain comes through. I've cut. These down for joints to make a roof. I shouldn't count on their allowing you to have them in your tent, Pamphil. Who has ever heard of civilians, women, and children, being allowed to live inside a camp? They'll stay with the wagons somewhere just outside, you'll be able to see them as much as you like in your spare time, but I shouldn't think they'd be allowed to live in your tent. But that isn't what I've come about. They tell me you're getting thin, you can't eat or sleep. Is that true? I must say you look all right. Though you could do with a haircut. Pamphil was a huge man with black tousled hair and beard and a bumpy forehead that looked double. A thickening of the frontal bone, like a ring or a steel band pressed over his temples, gave him a beetling, glowering look. When at the beginning of the revolution it had been feared that, as in 1905, the upheaval would be a short-lived episode in the history of the educated upper classes and leave the deeper layers of society untouched. Everything possible had been done to spread revolutionary propaganda among the people to upset them, to stir them up and lash them into fury. In those early days, men like Pamphil Palik, who needed no encouragement to hate intellectuals, officers and gentry with a savage hatred, were regarded by enthusiastic left-wing intellectuals as a rare find and greatly valued. Their inhumanity seemed a marvel of class consciousness their barbarism a model of proletarian firmness and revolutionary instinct. By such qualities Pamphil had established his fame, and he was held in great esteem by partisan chiefs and party leaders. To Yuri E. Andreevak this gloomy and unsociable giant, soulless and narrow-minded, seemed subnormal, almost a degenerate. Come into the tent, said Pamphil. No, why? It's pleasanter out in the open. Anyway. I couldn't get in. All right. Have it your own way. After all, it is a stinking hole. We can sit on the trees. They sat down on the springy birch saplings, and Pamphil told the doctor the story of his life. They say a tale is soon told. But mine is a long story. I couldn't tell it in three years. I don't know where to begin. Well, I'll try. My wife and I. We were young. She looked after the house. I worked in the fields. It wasn't a bad life. We had children. They drafted me into the army. They sent me to the war. Well, the war. What should I tell you about the war? You've seen it, comrade doctor. Then the revolution. I saw the light. The soldiers' eyes were opened. Not the Fritzes who are Germans, were the enemies, but some of our own people. Soldiers of the World Revolution, down your rifles, go home, get the bourgeois. And so on. You know it all yourself, comrade army doctor. Well, 
to go on. Then came the civil war. I joined the partisans. Now I'll have to leave out a lot or I'll never end. After all that, what do I see now, at the present moment? That parasite, he's brought up the two Stavropolsky regiments from the Russian front, and the first Orenburg Cossack as well. I'm not a child am I? Don't I understand? Haven't I served in the army? We're in trouble, doctor, it's all up with us. What he wants to do, the swine, is to fall on us with all that scum. He wants to surround us. But I've got a wife and children. If he comes out on top, how will they get away? They're innocent, of course, they have nothing to do with it, but this won't stop him. He'll tie up my wife with a rope and he'll torture her to death on my account, my wife, and my children, he'll break every bone in their bodies, he'll tear them apart. And you ask, why don't I sleep? A man could be made of iron, but a thing like that is to make you lose your mind. What an odd fellow you are, Pamphil. I can't make you out. Four years you've been away from them, you didn't even know where they were and you didn't worry. Now you're going to see them in a day or two, and instead of being happy about it you act as though it were their funeral. That was before, now it's different. He's beating us, the white bastard. Anyway, it isn't me we're talking about. I'll soon be... dead. But I can't take my little ones with me into the next world, can I? They'll stay and they'll fall into his dirty paws. He'll squeeze the blood out of them, drop by drop. Is that why you see will-o'-the-wisps? I was told you keep seeing things. Well, doctor, I haven't told you everything. I've kept back the most important thing. Now, I'll tell you the whole truth if you want it, I'll say it to your face, but you mustn't hold it against me. I've done away with a lot of your kind. There's a lot of officers' blood on my hands. Officers, bourgeois. And it's never worried me. Spilled it like water. Names and numbers all gone out of my head. But there's one little fellow I can't get out of my mind. I killed that youngster and I can't forget it. Why did I have to kill him? He made me laugh, and I killed him for a joke, for nothing, like a fool. During the February Revolution that was. Under Kerensky. We were having a mutiny. We were near a railway station. We'd left the front. They sent a young fellow, an agitator, to talk us into going back. To fight on to victory. Well, that little cadet came to talk us into being good. Just like a chicken, he was. Fight on to victory that was his slogan. He got up on a water butt shouting that slogan. The water butt was on the railway platform. He got up there, you see, so as to make his call to battle come from higher up, and suddenly the lid turned upside down under him. And he fell right in. Right into the water. You can't think how funny he looked. Made me split my sides laughing. I was holding a rifle. And I was laughing my head off. Couldn't stop. It was just as if he was tickling me. And then, I aimed and fired and killed him on the spot. I can't think how it happened. Just as though somebody had pushed me. Well, that's my will-o'-the-wisp. I see that station at night. At the time it was funny, but now I'm sorry. Was that at Beriyuka station near the town of Mili Uzayevo? Can't remember. Were you in the Zybushino Rebellion? Can't remember. Which front were you at? Was it the Western Front? Were you in the West? Somewhere like that. It could have been in the West. I can't remember.